Jonathan Kim from Rethink Reviews. That's what's happening. All right, now, John's going to review War on Kids, a very interesting movie. Uh, I got a lot of thoughts on it. You're not surprised by that. I think we're going to have an interesting conversation afterwards. So let's watch the review first, as we usually do, and then come back and talk about it. We have direct TV advertising. We have the drug companies spend over $10,000 per doctor in the United States to push their products. The only thing a psychoactive agent can do to a child's brain is disrupt it. That's why we're against having kids drink alcohol and smoke cigarettes. That's why we have very strict punishments for selling illegal drugs to children. Because we have a sense that there's something that should be inviolable about the growth and development of the child's brain. Yet we put toxins into their brains at extraordinarily high concentrations in the name of psychiatric treatment so that our children's brains literally grow up adapting to a bath of toxicity. Now often the initial psychiatric drug is the beginning of a lifelong dependence on psychiatric drugs which I will never become free. If you have kids, do you know where they are right now? Maybe they're in school, which probably makes you feel pretty good. But the documentary The War on Kids will shake you of that illusion, taking you inside the utter dysfunction of the American public school system, where a fear and loathing of kids has transformed our schools into prisons, complete with metal detectors and armed security. Every student is treated like a criminal, where failure to conform can earn you a drug-induced lobotomy. Forget about paranormal activity. If you have children, The War on Kids may be the scariest movie you see all year. While it's natural for kids to not like school, The War on Kids shows that kids are currently enduring a level of persecution that would have been unimaginable just 20 years ago. A big reason is zero-tolerance policies towards drugs, weapons, and violence, which on the surface sound like a good idea. But as the film shows, these policies quickly got out of hand, with kids being suspended for bringing nail files or mouthwash to school, drawing pictures of guns, or infamously, the little boy who was suspended for pointing a chicken finger at a teacher and saying, pow. Many of these zero-tolerance policies started as anti-drug measures, then grew even harsher in the wake of the Columbine shooting and those that followed. Violence at school is a legitimate concern, but by trying to keep kids safe from a few dangerous ones, our school system is treating all kids like potential super predators and has turned schools into prisons. That means constant monitoring by surveillance cameras, armed cops roaming the halls, and a prison's tightly regimented schedule. It also means that minor incidents that used to be handled by the school are now handled by the police, where a kid in a shoving match can be charged with felony assault. That could mean jail time, losing the right to vote, and throwing away any chance of going to college. And as the film makes sure to point out, zero-tolerance policies and high suspension rates do nothing to improve academic achievement, and actually hurt it. Another one of the film's villains is over-medication. As several of the educators and experts in the film attest, it's the kids who question authority, are full of energy, and have restless minds who usually end up being the most creative, intelligent, and rewarding students. But instead of giving these kids the extra attention they need to help them channel their energy and learn to rebel in constructive ways, many are diagnosed as having ADHD or some other brain malfunction requiring them to be drugged into a passive haze, which can lead to a lifetime of chemical dependency. But when one expert reads the official medical symptoms of ADHD, it's just a list of behaviors that annoy teachers, like fidgeting, talking back, being unfocused or impatient, in essence, being a regular kid. The War on Kids also reveals that 90% of the world's Ritalin prescriptions are filled in the U.S., which coincidentally is the country where drug companies can make the most money due to our lack of socialized medicine. What's worse, many of these psychoactive drugs fail to prevent and sometimes even cause the behaviors parents fear most evidenced by the fact that so many kids who commit suicide or are involved in school shootings are either on, getting off of, or manipulating medications. European countries like England have banned the use of psychotropic drugs on children. Yet in the U.S., approximately 4 million kids are on Ritalin, which can do serious long-term damage to young, developing brains and bodies. But the war on kids doesn't just point the finger at one or two culprits, because in the end, it's our entire approach to education that's screwed up. We put kids in prisons for 13 years, controlling their every thought, movement, and action, even when and if they can use the bathroom. We take away nearly all of their rights, drug them, humiliate them, and deluge them with homework so even their free time isn't free. We squelch their curiosity, creativity, originality, and capacity for free thinking. And then at graduation, we expect them to be entrepreneurs, outside-the-box thinkers, and contributors to a vibrant democracy. What does that say about us as a country? In interviews with high school kids in the film, they're painfully aware of how our police state education system is ruining their lives, as if just being a teenager didn't suck enough already. Or, as one expert puts it, why would any kid want to wake up every morning and go to jail? I'm Jonathan Kim, and this is a Rethink Review. All right, you know, Jonathan, upon rewatching that uh, review of yours, I think I agree with it a little bit more than I thought initially, okay? There are a lot of points of agreement. Some things I'm a little bit more skeptical about, right? So let's do, let's do both things. Now, part of the things that you discussed there are 
uh, Ritalin, you know, the overuse of drugs, uh, zero tolerance policies, security policies, whether they're video cameras or guards or getting kids, kids arrested. Then I want to talk about alternatives and what do we do, et cetera. So let's start with points of agreement, okay? Uh, one, uh, we're way over-drugging the kids. Yes. And, and an interesting point that you made in that review is I wonder if it's connected to the guys making money off the drugs. Right. And then when you think about it that way, you're like, uh-oh. It almost obviously is. Yeah, there, there's a part where um, a, a, a expert says, in France, there are in all of France, there are 4,000 kids on Ritalin. Mm -hmm. And in America, it's 4 million. He's like, you could probably find 4,000 kids, I mean, probably in, in like the three schools closest to us combined. And why is that? Are, why are, we, why are, are there more ADHD kids in America? There's not a good explanation. I think it's just because of the money. So you don't think that there is no use for a Ritalin. Like, I, I, some parents swear by it, right? So I, I can see that in extreme cases, my problem is, and, and tell me if, I, if you think differently, is that it's not that it can't help anybody. It's that it can't possibly be helping 4 million kids. Yeah. That it's way overprescribed. Right. Yeah, I mean, there, one of the more interesting parts um, in the movie is this uh, guy, he reads from the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, like the official definition of the symptoms of ADHD. Things like fidgets and squirms in their seat, leaves seat in classroom, runs, plays, or climbs excessively, blurts out answers, makes careless mistakes in schoolwork, doesn't pay attention or listen. And it was saying that like these are all problems that are that make teachers give them more attention. That's what the problem. I mean, I'm sure there's a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of people who actually have uh, you know, a, a chemical imbalance in their heads where they need it. But other than that, it's probably just kids or kids who are bored or kids who are pissed off at being at school or whatever. First of all, as you read that, it was, was described me almost to a T, right? I mean, back then or now? <laughs> <laughs> back then, because I was a kid and, you know, sometimes in class, guess what? You get bored, right? right? And I like classes overall at some points, right? Mm. Uh, but it still describes me. But look, I, in my life, I've seen one guy who I think is clearly ADHD, right? Mm -hmm. I think it exists. I mean, if it's, he, you know, if it's not him, uh, he's got something else, right? right? He can't sit still. He can't, one thought doesn't follow another, etc. And it's not that he's dumb. He's a really smart guy, very successful guy, etc. So I think it exists, right? But there's no way it's to the degree that they want. But, like, you're mentioning the teachers there. Do you think it's driven by the teachers in the schools? Or is it driven by the parents who are like, oh, I don't really, or is it the drug companies that convince the parents and the doctors that the kids need these? Or the obvious answer of a combination of those. Right. I mean, I think if the teachers probably had more time to spend with the students, it wouldn't be so bad if there were kids who, who acted out because then they could sort of take care of them. But there's a teacher in the, in the movie who says, I have 100 kids a day. If I spend five minutes a day with, the, with each kid, there are not enough minutes in the day. I can't mm -hmm. teach anything. So now it's basically like, oh, geez, well, we're getting behind. Just got to get this kid out of here. Or, I mean, now it's basically like there's a problem where teachers are almost prescribing it, where they're telling their, the parents, like, your kid is acting out too much. You got to get them on some med or something, or they can't come back in class. Jesus, man, that's and, crazy. And look, and it's John, it's hard for me to grasp how much the system has changed since I went to school. And I went to school, you know, high school, et cetera, about 20 years ago. And I didn't see this stuff. I saw some of it, but mm -hmm. very, very, very little. If I went back into my public high school in the suburbs I grew up in, New Jersey, are they going to have security cameras everywhere? Are half the kids going to be on Ritalin? Or it's just in some cases, in some cities, et cetera. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. I mean, I think that you probably would see more security in general. And it's something that, that, te that teachers, I mean, that parents ask for. But there, there's a, a teacher, I mean, there's a principal in the, in the movie who says, like, Whenever like a new class comes in, the teachers all I mean the ki the parents always ask about security. They never ask about like curriculum, <laughs> uh -huh. things like that. I mean, in, in these, to some degree, there's an overhyping of the danger of this and like the term super predator that was created for like these just insane kids who just want to kill everybody. You know, I'm sure. I mean, when you think of all the millions of kids in America and how many of them actually commit these acts, it's a tiny, tiny percentage. Is that worth putting kids in prison for? And I've read statistics in the past where school violence has actually gone down uh, considerably since Columbine, right? But the reaction to it has gone up, right? right? Because it's so much in the news. Whereas, like, in the 1950s, they didn't hear about it. If something happened in Colorado, they never heard about it in California or in Washington or wherever, right? right? And so, but at the same time, I see the... The reason behind the paranoia, worry, concern, etc. I mean, you can't have the kids bringing guns to school. Sometimes they do. So how do you balance right. that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that in in terms of 
the violence going down, it's probably because after Columbine, more people were aware to look for warning signals, you know, or friends would say, hey, my, fr my friend is acting like this, maybe I should, I should talk to someone about it. So it's probably being dealt with that way. Because there's one, there's one student says, you know, the cameras, for the most part, they can't stop anything from happening. They can, they, you can look at it afterwards and see what happened, but it won't actually stop anything. And what was it? There's, is it Owensboro in Kentucky, where there was a school shooting where the kid was just like waiting outside, like in, like in the playground, and was waiting for kids to come out. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's other ways to do it, or that they'll figure out where the cameras, are, where the cameras aren't pointing, or things like that. And but, but they said that the the schools with the most um, with the most security measures, with the most stringent security measures, have the most incidents in terms of catching in terms of catching people, which either means they're catching more of the people or it's not helping at all because the rates are still high. It's not acting as a deterrent. That definitely depends on how you look at it. Right? Okay. <laughs> so let me go to again the points of agreement and then come back to my concerns. So look, security cameras way too much. Big brother's watching, and we've talked about this before. And they're watching the teachers. If she does any, if she or he does anything slightly wrong, then they're in trouble. If the kids do anything slightly wrong, they're in trouble. Man, when I was a kid, I did stuff wrong all the time. Right. I mean, t today I'd have been in maximum penitentiary lockdown next to the Unabomber or something. Once I took on a lab table, I just went to sleep. I got up on the lab table in chemistry class and went to sleep. Right now, they'd be like, oh my. A warning is cell block A. Oh, we got somebody's out of control. I mean, and that's the tip of the iceberg, right? So way overreaction on the on the video cameras. I hear you on that. Uh, and felony assault for you know kids pushing each other. Right. I must have literally gotten into thirty seven fights from elementary school to high school. Right. I'd be the biggest criminal in the world now. Yeah, it's. it's, it's I'm there, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, there, there's a part where I mean, a, a girl. I mean, she actually she brought alcohol to school and she and she like put some of it in some in some soda and like passed it around to some friends, and that girl was going to get I think uh, expelled for like a year. Mm -hmm. And she said, if a cop had picked me up with with, with booze, I would have gotten like a like a ticket and a fine. But you know, it's harsher at school. Yeah, I hear you. Now again, though, the, the, so I agree with you on all that stuff. But school's always been prison, hasn't it, John? I mean, like we, I mean, nobody, the kids didn't want to go then, they don't want to go now. Uh, and by its nature, you got to lock up the kids and have them read stuff that they don't, you know, nine out of ten kids don't like. So right. is that really that different? It's, it depends on how far you want to take it, though, because if it's like barbed wire, cops at the school, like, I mean, there's, there's one child psychologist, she said one of the, the most common complaints she gets from parents uh, uh, is that, their kids are not allowed to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. That they're either punished if they go, if they go, or they're rewarded if they're not, and things like that. Then also, I think just with class sizes getting bigger and bigger, and now with just this really charged feeling of paranoia that I'm, I'm sure didn't exist when we were at school or before that, where people were worried about ma about mass shootings. It's just gotten worse and it's gotten worse and worse. And I think that. I would guess that teacher pay hasn't been going up a whole lot either. It's just becoming one of those crappier and crappier jobs where the people who are staying either get burned out really, they're idealists who get burned out, or they're people who, are, who just don't care. And they're saying that most of the discipline cases, like in, in one school district, it was, it was something like 66% of the discipline cases of kids being sent to students were reported by 25% of the teachers. There's some teachers who are just dicks. <laughs> and they're just gonna and they're just gonna nail people all the time. Like when you went to school, you knew there was that teacher who was the jerk, or right. that teacher who didn't like Mexicans, or whatever it was. And now these people are basically getting kind of vindicated because like they get these kids thrown out. Right now, the thing is though, again, when, when I was going to school, sometimes the teachers didn't let you go to the bathroom. So I'm not that blown away by that. Mm -hmm. And there's always been teachers that have been dicks, and they were dicks back then. They're right. dicks now. So I don't think that's altogether that different. But uh, but certainly the barbed wire, et cetera, is. But John, so what's the alternative? Like, I mean, sure, no barbed wire. I get it, right? <laughs> but what do we do differently? What has gone wrong and how do we fix it? I would guess that it, it seems that the, the way that we're trying to solve the problem is all through the punishment, where as opposed to like, Figuring out who the troubled kid is. If a kid gets in a scuffle or gets in a fight, you know, you don't send them off to jail. You have them talk to a counselor. Like you punish them. I mean, there's this idea that zero tolerance policies have become like harshest, harshest punishment, no matter what. As opposed to zero tolerance could just mean you'll get in trouble somehow, and then we'll figure it out based on the grade of of what you, of what you did. Because like there's a case of a it was a girl's birthday and she brought a cake and the mom brought a knife 
to use to cut the cake. And the kid said to the teacher, oh, my mom gave me this knife. I, you know, that's probably like against our, our policy and everything. And the teacher's like, you did the right thing. She used the knife to cut up the cake, then suspended the kid. Come on, 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 come on. Okay, but, look, here's... But, but I mean, I, I know you're saying in terms no, of like what do we do. But, let, let me just uh, do one point of emphasis on that. Zero tolerance, we have a million percent agreement on, okay? It, it is by definition stupid because... You're saying, no matter what you did, I'm going to give you the maximum punishment. I'm a huge believer in incentives and disincentives. And if you tell the kids, I'm going to go nuclear, no matter how small the infraction is, you actually give them an incentive to commit large infractions. Right. Okay, uh, let alone the fact that you're saying, if you have a zero tolerance policy, I will not use human judgment. Mm -hmm. I will be purposely stupid. Right. right. And so that I, there's no way I'm going to agree to zero tolerance. It's a dumb, dumb policy. It never works in any way, and it certainly does not work in schools. Okay, that's an easy one. We get beyond that, you still have some security issues, and you still have the fact that they got to go to school. Right. I mean, I, I think that with, I mean, in terms of the guns, I mean, I think it totally makes sense that if you bring a load a gun to school, you should get in serious, serious problem. I think yes. everyone agrees yes. with that. Um, but also, I mean, I, I'm not sure how many kids are, are trying to come into school with, like, hiding a bunch of guns and then all of a sudden get them all out and start shooting everyone. I mean, in Columbine, they, they kind of went charging into the school, right? Right. And, you know, you're not going to, you can't, it, it's, it's almost impossible to stop someone from committing a crime if they're not trying to get away with it. Uh -huh. And so I, I think that a lot of these, a, a lot of these That's cases. That's an interesting point. <laughs> A lot of these cases, I mean, like there was a case where a, a kid had, uh, I think, an unloaded gun that was, or a, a toy gun in a backpack that fell out. But, but it, in any case, we've dealt with how, how dumb zero tolerance is. It is a tough thing, but it's like, are, are you going to make places into, pri into prisons or make kids feel, I mean, they're, they're saying because of zero tolerance, kids are actually less likely to report people. Because mm -hmm. it's like their friend, they're like, well, I don't want him to get, you know, if, say he bought, like, a, you know, he, he brought a gun that's unloaded and you want to show it to me because he thought it was really cool. Am I going to tell him and get him to have his life be destroyed? Maybe yeah. I wouldn't do that. You know, the other thing I think about, and we, I know we had to wrap this up because it's been a while, but it's a really interesting topic. I think, you know, so much of education is on the parents. If you set the right expectations, et cetera, your kid's going to do better. I read endless studies on it, right? And I believe that. But at the same time, when liberals say there isn't enough money, uh, the conservatives howl over that. And I know why they're howling, because it is so much on the parents to make sure your kids have a good education. But the money, of course, matters. Right. I was reading about schools in the 1940s in New York, and apparently the public schools in New York were excellent back then. Why? Part of the reason, and this is really interesting, is because of the Depression. During the Depression, they had less kids in the 1930s. So in the 1940s, the class size was so small. And the teachers at the time were, were paid really well because it was a good government job and it was secure and stable. So you had some of the best teachers with little, small class size, and the schools wound up being excellent. So if we had, you know, smaller classes and we paid our teachers better, would it make a difference? My guess is obvious. Yeah, if it was a desired job where you paid them like 70 grand or something like that and you could raise a family and send kids to college, people would be fighting like crazy for them. I mean, especially but, in this economy. Yeah, I mean, cuz right now, like I said, like you get the the young idea like idealistic kids and they come in and they want to go to the inner city schools and then they just get destroyed, you know, they just can't do it anymore and so they leave. And the ones who do stay are the ones who really don't care, but they know that they get their tenure it'll just be like a safe job and they can just kind of muddle through for the rest of their lives. And there are teachers like that but what kind of job draws a person like that and what and what is the motivation for keeping them is like well better than nobody so yeah that's that's not the right way to go and i feel that we've spent so much money on education but i'm not sure we spend it in the right places and so that's that's what i'm really concerned about all right well this is a topic obviously we'll come back to a lot on the show but the movie's called war on kids and you can check it out on rethink reviews on youtube huffington post and rethinkreviews.net.net all right jonathan kim thanks as always thank you we'll be right back